Hello, everyone. This is the April presentation of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. I am Ben Woodbury with the Friends and will be your host today. As a reminder, all recent past and future First Wednesday online lectures are now available on our new Friends of History webpage. The citation is below. Just click on the lecture series link on the homepage. Information is also available on the webpage on the walking tours of historic downtown Santa Fe, a major initiative of the Friends of History. Our monthly lectures are being provided free of charge by the Friends of History with the support of the New Mexico History Museum. We do, however, accept and encourage uh, donations. These will go directly to support the lecture series and more importantly, all history museum programs and exhibits. Should you wish to make a donation, just go to our website and click on the donate button at the top of the page. Before introducing today's speaker, I want you to know that information for next month's, that is May's presentation, will be available shortly. Just look for an announcement in our upcoming email. If you wish to be on our mailing list, you can sign up on our webpage or email us at a New Mexico Museum History Friends of History at gmail.com. This is also cited below. Today's speaker is Ms. Cynthia Culbertson, who will speak on Hoofbeats Through History, the story of the horse in New Mexico. A horse lover since birth, Cynthia has served as a consultant for multiple museum exhibitions featuring horses. Most notably, she served as co-curator of an exhibition at the International Museum of the Horse, featuring artifacts from 27 museums around the world, including such prestigious institutions as the British Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She has also served as a consultant for the equine components of many other projects, including one at UNESCO World Heritage Museum. As well, Cynthia is the author of several books on the subject of Arabian horses and is a regular contributor to international equine media. She has been a lecturer in more than 10 countries and has scripted and narrated multiple educational videos, including a New York Times Vision Award uh, recipient. We are most fortunate to having her join us to the international online media. Cynthia's pre presentation will focus on the influence of New Mexico narrated in the history of the horse in the Americas, a story both fascinating and profound. From prehistoric times to the present, she will offer evidence that New Mexico is arguably the most significant state in the story of the whole. presentation will focus on the influence of New Mexico. As is our practice, Ms. Culbertson's talk will be followed by a live question and answer period. Questions and comments can be posted at any time during and after the presentation on the YouTube chat room just below this video. Upon completion of today's event, both the lecture and the Q&A session will be posted on the Friends of History webpage, as well as the History Museum's YouTube and Facebook pages. And now we welcome Ms. Culbertson. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm very honored to be with you all today and many thanks to Friends of History for your steadfast support of our cultural heritage through the Museum of New Mexico Foundation. My topic today is a very broad one, and to truly do it justice, we would need experts in paleontology, zooarchaeology, Native American history, Spanish colonial history, cowboy and ranching culture, and beyond. And I'm not an expert in any of those fields, but I do come to you with passion passion for the horse and its influence upon humankind, and passion for the history of the land of enchantment, our great state of New Mexico. <laughs> it 
If we stop and listen to the echoes of New Mexico history, we're certain to hear hoofbeats and the sound of neighing. And I believe when it comes to the story of the horse, we can build a good case that New Mexico is the most influential state in the nation. So today I'd like to explore a little bit of that history with you. So when do you think New Mexico first experienced the sound of the hoofbeats of horses? A good guess might be the 16th century when Spaniards first brought horses to what is now New Mexico. But in truth, the sound of hoofbeats go much, much further back into history. Scientists have a more complete outline of the evolutionary history of the horse than almost any other animal. And most of this story took place in North America, where ancestral horses grew from many-toed browsers adapted to a jungle and forest environment to single-hooved grazers when the climate became rich with grasses. The ancestors of our modern horses have been around about 55 million years. And to put that into perspective, the dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago. New Mexico plays a prominent role in this history, since many fossils representing the evolutionary history of the horse are found here, especially from the Miocene period. This slide shows the distribution of ancestral horses about 20 million years ago, and you can see virtually all of New Mexico is included. Ancestral horse fossils in New Mexico include many examples of protohippus, a three-toed type of horse about the size of a modern donkey. There was even an entirely new species of protohippus found in Dixon, New Mexico in 2009. That species lived here in a time period of about 14 million to 6 million years ago. The photo on the left is of the find in Dixon, New Mexico, while the right is a more complete example of protohippus, and at the bottom is a diagram of those three toes. And to stray from the topic just a little bit, can you guess what other ancient animal was discovered at this same site? A camel. Camels also evolved in North America, specifically Western North America. And so New Mexico features in that story too, from fossil history to the U.S. camel cores. And yes, camels are another passion of mine and a bit closer to my special area of history, the Arabian horse in the Near East. But I digress. Back to the horse. At this point, we're just listening to the pitter-patter of ancestral horses with many toes, but we're almost to the sound of hoofbeats in New Mexico, which first happened during the Pleistocene period, more commonly known as the Ice Age. Horses, zebras, and all fossil horses of the genus Equus have a single hoof. This map shows us that New Mexico is rich with fossils of these ancestors of our modern horses throughout our entire state. From these artists' renderings, we can recognize these as equus, horses, and certainly a galloping herd of these would give us the sound of hoofbeats. We now have a date range of more than 50 million years from the ancestors of these horses to these animals recognizable to us, which lived about 125,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago. So now you have an idea just how long New Mexico has been associated with horses. This slide shows the migration of horse ancestors to Asia beginning several million years ago. Again, note the highlight includes New Mexico. But about 11,000 to 13,000 years ago, the last of these horses left or became extinct in the Americas. Ironically, this is about the same time groups of humans were crossing into the Americas from Asia, but also the time when Alaskan grasslands were becoming tundra. So whether it was the lack of grazing due to climate change or whether humans contributed to the demise of the horse in America is still unproven. This story is also still evolving, as a recent study indicated that the family tree of horses may be further simplified by studying ancient DNA that shows that fossils identified as different species may have actually been the same far-reaching species. I have always loved this quote. Far, far back in our dark soul, the horse prances. And of course, this quote also has a New Mexico connection, since these are the words of D.H. Lawrence, the famed English writer who came to New Mexico, fell in love with our state, and was actually buried in Taos. But the question for us today is just how far back does the horse prance in human history? I thought it was important for us to ask this question and explore the backstory a bit before coming back to New Mexico. 
These cave paintings in France date to about 25,000 years ago. And from the exquisite beauty and spirituality of this art, it is apparent that humans were already in awe of the horse. By this time, they had definitely pranced into our souls. From the arrows shown here, that horses also pranced into our stomachs, an important source of protein. And if you order a sandwich in parts of Europe today, that may still be the case. But how and when did that picture change from being just a source of food to becoming perhaps the most important domesticated animal in all of human history? While horses may have been domesticated at more than one site, there is much evidence for horse domestication in the steppes of Central Asia, particularly the bowtie culture of Kazakhstan. I've been privileged to work with zooarchaeologist Dr. Sandra Olson on a number of projects, and she's been heavily involved in research regarding horse domestication. Dr. Olson believed that studying humans would be just as important as studying ancient horses. When it came to domestication, of course, human lives would show evidence of change when they began to partner with the horse. To that end, they discovered remnants of corral posts in Kazakhstan, consistent with keeping large animals inside. But the most conclusive evidence came when the contents of this pottery was examined at the molecular level by scientists in the UK. Can anyone guess what they found? Mare's milk. So why is this evidence that the horse had been domesticated by this time, about 6,000 years ago? The answer is pretty simple. How could you milk a wild mare? Interestingly enough, even until today, the Mongolians of the Asian steppe milk mares, ferment the milk, and make an alcoholic beverage called kumis. I have tasted mare's milk, which is actually very sweet, but I've never tasted kumus, although I've heard if you're not used to it, it can be pretty awful. But this has led to my own theory about the origins of horse racing. I believe it probably happened when a couple of these bowtie horsemen were sitting around and drinking a little too much kumus, and one said to the other, I bet my horse is faster than yours. Boom, world's first horse race. Can't be proven, but I think it's a pretty good theory. Beyond that, of course, the domestication of the horse was a pivotal point in human history because it revolutionized hunting, warfare, transportation, and agriculture. So when did the first modern horses come to New Mexico? Or maybe we should say, when did the sound of hoofbeats return to New Mexico as horses came home to the land of their ancestors? The answer is still pretty impressive. The very first horse to enter what is now the United States of America was with DeSoto in Florida in 1539. New Mexico was next in 1540, and this is just 19 years shy of 500 years ago. This was with Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. I think it's interesting because I found out when researching pictures for this lecture that this historic Remington painting is actually available online as a beach towel, which is rather ironic since New Mexico is not exactly known for its beaches. But most of the approximately 250 horses that entered what is now New Mexico with Coronado were either of Arabian blood, Barb, or Andalusian in origin, all of which indicate the strong influence of North Africa and the Islamic world of Spain. Now, once again, I can't help but stray from the topic just a bit because my specialty is the Arabian horse. When the Europeans first encountered Arabians, it was during the Crusades, and from the 1500s of the Ottoman Empire to when Napoleon conquered Egypt, European and later American art changed forever in its depiction of horses once these Arabians were introduced. Whereas previously, horses were mostly shown as beasts of burden in European art. With the coming of Arabians, generals, leaders, and the aristocracy were depicted on these noble animals, and the horse itself became an important part of the images. And I bring this up because when we see artistic depictions of Coronado, they almost always show him riding a white horse that certainly looks more Arabian than Andalusian. But even when the native peoples who had never seen horses drew the Spanish horses, we notice the characteristics of the Arab or Andalusian as seen in this rock art, with the high arched necks, delicate legs, prancing gait, and even the small inward tipped ears. And I thought it would be interesting to compare this rock art from Arabia, dating to approximately 2,000 years ago, with the rock art depicting the Spaniards' horses in the Southwest. Everyone thinks of the Kentucky Derby, which will be 147 years old this year, as a historic American horse race. 
But where was the first horse race in what is now the United States? New Mexico, of course. It was an unofficial horse race, but a horse race nonetheless. And most importantly, a horse race of record. We know it was run on December 27th, 1540. That's 481 years ago. Between Rodrigo Maldonado and Francisco Coronado. Coronado fell off his horse in front of Rodrigo's horse and was hit in the head. We also know that the injuries Coronado sustained during this race actually affected him for the rest of his life. And just in case you didn't believe me earlier, here is yet one more portrait of Coronado, an idealized painting of him encountering Native Americans, demonstrating that important personages in European and American art were almost always depicted riding an Arabian horse. Don Juan de Oñate is also very important in New Mexico horse history since he brought so many horses into the state. And although his graffiti shown here is the beginning of the 17th century, he was actually in New Mexico accompanied by 1,500 horses by the late 16th century. Now here's an interesting story. In 1599, during the month of October, a patrol that was going to Zuni Pueblo encountered a freak snowstorm that caused a halt to their march and forced the patrol to set up camp near Acoma Pueblo. During the evening, in the blizzard-like conditions, almost 30 head of horses managed to break out of those temporary corrals set up with the soldiers. And the next day, when it was found that the horses had escaped, the soldiers mounted a search. It was to no avail. This is the first band of horses of record in what is now the United States of America to run free, and it happened in New Mexico. After horses disappeared from North America some 10,000 years ago, where was the first foal of record born in what is now the U.S.? By now, I think we all know the answer. That's right, New Mexico. So you can certainly say that modern horse breeding in the United States began here with the Spaniards, and very soon thereafter with the native peoples who obtained them. Which brings me to what I believe is perhaps the most important distinction of New Mexico when it comes to horse history in the United States. New Mexico is essentially ground zero for the genesis of some of the greatest horse cultures known to history. I love this rock drawing because in simple line form, it depicts a moment when all was about to change forever for the Native Americans of the West. The artist also depicts a gesture which reflects the unrivaled future success of these peoples with horses. Instead of capturing, killing, or trapping the horse, the human appears to be reaching out, indicating kindness and solidarity, the beginnings of a partnership that would forever shape American culture. Here we see a map of where and approximately when the native peoples of the Americas obtained horses. And you'll notice the pink lines of the map confirming that the heaviest dispersal and among the earliest is through New Mexico. And thus began the development of a horse nation among the tribes of the West, as evidenced by this powerful poem. My horses, prancing they are coming. My horses, neighing they are coming. All over the universe they come. A horse nation they will dance. May you behold them. A pivotal moment of the history of the horse in New Mexico was the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Prior to that, the Spaniards used the native peoples as slaves, and they were forbidden by law to have horses or guns. Yet they learned how to train horses for riding and as pack animals during their tenure as forced laborers. At the time of the revolt, the Spaniards were forced to leave so quickly that they left many horses behind with a group of people who had gained familiarity with them. So in the 14 years before the return of the Spaniards to power in the region, the Puebloans raised large herds of horses and began trading them to nomadic tribes throughout New Mexico and the region and teaching them how to ride and train horses. The horse revolutionized every aspect of the lives of these people. Hunting. Warfare. Transportation. Having never seen horses before, there were no words for these amazing animals among the native peoples, and they were variously known as big dog, elk dog, or holy dog, 
since previously dogs were the only pack animals of these nomadic tribes. Remember when I spoke earlier about how Sandra Olson studied the people to find clues as to how their lives might have changed at the moment of horse domestication? This same concept may be applied to native cultures. A perfect example is the teepee. Before the horse, teepees and other dwellings were limited in size by the amount the nomads and dogs could carry. It was only with the coming of the horse and its superior strength and size did larger teepees begin to appear. So this stereotypical symbol of Plains Indians exists in this size and form because of horses returning to their ancestral homelands. The horse also gave these cultures something else that was extremely precious, time. The hours spent moving, hunting, and gathering food, or even in warfare, were dramatically decreased. There was an equally dramatic increase in the detail and type of art produced by the Native Americans, as we can see in these examples. Shields. Horse masks. Dance sticks. And even toys. This art also shows the importance of the horse as a revered artistic symbol of strength and spirituality. The most amazing part of this story, however, also involves time. Many military historians believe that nomadic tribes of the West, particularly the Comanche and the Kiowa Apache, were perhaps the best light cavalry in all of history. What makes this achievement mind-boggling is that other cultures using the horse, such as the Bedouin, who conquered two-thirds of the known world on the back of their Arabian horses, or the Mongol Empire, the largest contiguous land empire in history, had horses for thousands of years to develop this expertise. The Native Americans had only two centuries at best from the time they first encountered horses. Other cultures also had written treatises on horse training, from Xenophon of the Greeks to the Kukuli tablets of the Hittites, to the Furusiya manuscripts of the Islamic world and the countless European works on horses and horse training. Yet the Native Americans became some of the world's most famous horsemen in the blink of an eye in historical terms. Look at this warrior's ease with his horse, using a knotted rope instead of a bit. No blanket or saddle. This most definitely can't be credited to observations about riding horses from the Spaniards with their severe bits, spurs, and heavy saddles. I believe this warrior's horsemanship would be the envy of even the best Olympic rider today. There is another great parallel to be drawn between other famed nomadic horse cultures in history, such as the Bedouin and the Mongols, and the development of the Native Americans' expertise with horses. Rather than just a beast of burden, the horse was a respected comrade, a brother, loved and admired for its courage and importance to life and culture. Their very lives became dependent on horses. A beautiful illustration of this respect is the war god's horse song of the Navajo. I am turquoise woman's son, on top of belted mountain, beautiful horses. My horse has a hoof like a striped agate. His legs are like quick lightning. My horse's body is like an eagle feather arrow. My horse has a tail like a trailing black cloud. The holy wind blows through his mane. His mane is made of rainbows. My horse's eyes are made of stars. I am wealthy because of him. Before me peaceful, behind me peaceful, under me peaceful, over me peaceful. Peaceful voice when he neighs. I am everlasting and peaceful. I stand for my horse. Coming back to New Mexico, if you remember the slide about the dispersal of the horse to the tribes, you notice that most of the earliest dates are to the Apache of New Mexico, 1585 for the Mescalero, 1600 for Hikaria and Lipan, 1625 for the Chiricahua and the Kiowa Apache. While the Apache were known to eat roasted horse meat, they were also known for their amazing horsemanship. They talked to the bellies of their pregnant mares so that the foal would know their voice when born. After a battle or hunt, the horse was always cared for before the warrior ate or joined his family.
They learned to ride while young, and once a bond was established between warrior and horse, no saddles or spurs were needed. They rode as one. They carefully accustomed their horses to the sound of gunfire and rewarded them with bags of grain around their necks. They selected horses for bravery and stamina and celebrated those horses that were eager to go into battle. And while I use the Apache as an example because their homelands included New Mexico, this same expertise of horsemanship was seen or even exceeded in many other Native American tribes in New Mexico and beyond. It is important to remember that daily life was improved immeasurably by the use of the horse. We must also keep in mind that it was not only the nomadic tribes who benefited from the horse, but also the Puebloans who have a very special role in this history because they were responsible for so many other native peoples obtaining them. And as shown by this magnificent painted hide from Tal's Pueblo, Puebloan art and culture was greatly influenced by horses. And while perhaps not transformed as drastically as for the Plains Indians, horses were a source of revenue and gained a prominent position in ceremonial rituals. Santiago, the horse saint, was one of the only Catholic saints to become a part of Pueblo ritual. The influence of the Spanish game, the rooster pole, also became a way to display equestrian skill among the Puebloans. The Diné, or Navajo, first obtained horses by 1600 in New Mexico, and also echo the similar respect and spiritual appreciation of the horse. Despite the amazing light cavalry and astonishing rates of arrow fire by the tribes of the West, their glory days as horse nations would eventually come to an end. Now we come to the part where the neighs and hoofbeats of horses echoing across New Mexico also include the horses of the U.S. Cavalry. The U.S. Cavalry was officially established in 1861, largely in response to the Mexican-American War, the vast territories of the West, and the relentless westward expansion into Native American territory causing conflict. I have to say I do love the sentiment of this poster, which places the horse in the role of honored partner. A fascinating part of this history are the groups of African-American soldiers, known as Buffalo Soldiers, who served at 11 of New Mexico's 16 frontier forts. This wonderful image shows soldiers at Fort Stanton grooming their horses in 1887, including a number of Buffalo Soldiers from the 9th Cavalry. And another historic photograph, dated 1898, of the last Buffalo Soldiers to serve in New Mexico. I love this photograph of a U.S. cavalryman and his lady. They look pretty serious, but notice anything unusual about this picture? They have switched hats, which I think is a great bit of humor for us all to enjoy all these years later. The story of the horse in New Mexico could never be complete without addressing cowboys, cattle, and ranching, a subject well deserving of its own lecture. From the days of the open range to the establishment of large ranches, horses were integral to the cattle industry in New Mexico, and the state has a particularly rich heritage in ranching. In many ways, a cowboy culture also arose, and like the horse cultures of Native American warriors, riding and training skills and a knowledge of horses was paramount to success. This great photo from the Library of Congress shows a group of New Mexico cowboys from a large historic ranch in the territory. Notice the different style of hats. Obviously, cowboys of that era did not all wear what we consider today to be a cowboy hat. And I had to include this guy because his sense of style is definitely his own. So, from the ancestors of the horse who called New Mexico home 50 million years ago, to the first sound of hoofbeats 100,000 years ago to New Mexico today, where there are approximately 147,000 horses. The story of the horse in the land of enchantment is far from over. From ranching to ranch rodeo. to the horses still celebrated among the Native Americans of our region, to the many horse shows throughout the state for all breeds and disciplines of riding, 
to the thousands of New Mexicans who ride for pleasure. And now I'm going to conclude with yet another New Mexico first in horse history. It was in New Mexico at Ruidoso Downs that the world's first ever $1 million horse race was held. Today, this race, the All-American Futurity, has a purse of $3 million, making it the richest race for two-year-olds in North America. So the next time you see a horse in the land of enchantment, remember what a marvelous story the state of New Mexico has to tell when it comes to equine history. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia, uh, yes. thank you very much. You're um, quite I've, welcome. I've lost my picture, but um, I'm here. And I uh, really want to thank you. I found, um, I, I think we found that presentation uh, really remarkable as you talked about the horse in New Mexico in the context, not only of the evolution of, of, of the horse, but its historic relationship with man throughout and provides a great framework for appreciating and highlighting, uh, of course, the importance of New Mexico um, uh, in the spread, uh, spread of the horse, which is such a fascinating story uh, in and of itself. Um, I, uh, I noticed in some, of the, in some of my research that there are, a number, of course, a number of breeds and of um, um, numerable breeds of horses. And there's, a, there's actually a colonial Spanish horse breed or set of, a set of breeds um, uh, related to that, which of course with the, with the benefits of DNA, I don't know if you have any familiar, uh, with the benefits of DNA testing in terms of identifying it. I don't well, know if- Well, one of the audience that. members may have more details about this, but I know some years back, Gus Cothran, who's a geneticist, did some research on a wild herd, I think in, in Northern New Mexico. And in fact, their DNA was very identical to the horses of Southern Spain. And so the local mm -hmm. legend was they had escaped and stayed there and kind of all bred. And sometimes those stories are, are just, you know, they don't work when it comes to DNA. But that particular story, prove that the DNA was almost 100% Spanish. So it's yeah. quite interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think it's wonderful. Um, I do know that we have at least one question um, from uh, uh, Stephen Jules Rubin, one of our attendees. And uh, he, he was struck by the fact that there are, in fact, Arabian horses in New Mexico. Uh, I'm sure they, uh, and his, he was wondering if there was any 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 evidence of lipids honors. Uh, well, I think when we go back to that first introduction, the Spaniards brought some of their best horses, and if we could do the DNA on those, I know there would be a variety uh, because of the Moorish influence. They did have purebred Arabians; they had their own Andalusians. I think the actual lipids honor is a little later in history. But he would be correct in that horses came to the Americas, which would have very similar DNA to what later Spain gave that became the Lipizzaner breed. And then certainly in, in modern history, New Mexico, like many states in America, has so many different breeds of horses um, that today, certainly I'm sure there are Lipizzaners here as well, as well as Arabians and many other breeds. But I think in that first importation, the Lipizzaner as a breed was not so firmly identified, but its ancestors would have been among those horses coming to the Americas. Yes, indeed, just fascinating. Um, I'm also struck at, at the close bonds that, between uh, the uh, man and the horse. And also, I think it's re reflected within, within New Mexico in terms of the relationships with, uh, among the Spanish, the Puebloans, uh, and ultimately, the, uh, you know, the, uh, what we refer to ourselves as the Anglos who came into the state and have each had, 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 their, had their strong ties. Just shows what a, I mean, what, what a unique bond there is. Uh, and all three of those culturally had really great 
horse histories. We can't yes. discount the Spanish. They had an incredible history of horsemanship. They had two very ancient, distinct uh, styles of riding, a la brida, and I think the other is a la geneda, which was more Islamic world influence, and a la brida was the very heavy war horses they had. So they came with a tremendous knowledge and ability with horses, really famed throughout Europe. And you're right, then we have the Native American, and then we have the whole ranching. So each of those uh, could deserve their own lectures and books about the cultural influence of, of horses in that. Right. Um, uh, Kath, uh, Kathleen, any any sense of any any additional questions? Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe while we're waiting on her, I want to point out. I think I said at the beginning, you know, this lecture is so broad; it would take many experts to do it justice. But I wanted to give a, a shout out to some of the references I used. Do. Um, that wonderful chart of the disbursement uh, was from uh, Ned and Jody Martin. They're of Hawk Hill Press. They have very beautiful books on horse tack and Native Americans, really visually stunning books and have done a lot of research on the subject. I think a good one too is Song for the Horse Nation, which is about the influence of the horse on Native Americans. And then there are a lot of books about um, Spain and the, the culture of, of the Spanish with horses as well. So if anybody out there is interested more particularly in one of these cultures, there's a lot of great references out there. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's wonderful. I appreciate that, and I, I'm sure I'm sure that sure there will be. Um, well, I, I think that's it for us. Did you have any other further thoughts before before we say goodbye? Well, just I think it's fun for everybody in New Mexico to realize that this state really does have a special relationship with the history of the horse. So just think about that next time you drive by a field of horses. Yeah. And indeed, indeed, I will. So, uh, well, thank you, Cynthia. I really appreciate uh, uh, the presentation. I do, I, I think it really does capture uh, the spirit, not only in New Mexico, but of the horse, you know, in, in, in general. And we much appreciate you ta taking the time. You're quite welcome. For our audience, uh, I did want to mention, uh, we had, uh, had some dialogue with the Northern New Mexico Horsemen's Association, and uh, they have mentioned that they are, are going to be sponsoring a, a talk by Joy Poole uh, on, based on her book, uh, Over the Santa Fe Trail to New Mexico, uh, to Mexico, excuse me, uh, which is a travel diary of Dr. Rowland Willard. Uh, and uh, the details on that will be provided uh, are right now uh, in the chat for those who wish to uh, uh, consider, uh, consider that. Thank you for taking the time to uh, um, uh, to enjoy uh, this presentation.